So there's a question asked. I'm going to end off with this question for now because then we'll have a meeting. Um, so how many souls are found in a person? In other words, we outline that there's this natural tendency soul. We're not getting to evil and positive. We're just going to these two souls. And then there's a godly soul. So seemingly there's only two souls. But there's a deeper question asked. Well, doesn't that mean there's three? Because on one hand, on one side I have this natural tendency. On the other side I got this godly tendency. And somewhere in the middle has got to be me. Like, where is the decision made? Isn't there a me in the middle that they're fighting over? Isn't there a struggle in the middle? Isn't who am I? And in essence, there are such opinions. There are such opinions that say that there's three souls. Some opinions say there's five really? souls. Because if you add in the evil inclination, the positive inclination, all of a sudden you have five souls. You have evil, natural, positive, godly, and then you. But the Tanya seems to say, or says, that there's only two souls. And the you, or the me, is the combination of those two souls. It's not a third soul. It's not like there's a third being. If you take those both away, that would be me. And in essence, what is me is the outcome of those two souls. And that seems to make a lot more sense. In other words, because from one day I can be very grounded on earth with very little spiritual tendencies. I can move into spiritual planes. I can move back. And what we see is that people that work on this, as they grow with experiences and other things, they tend to settle. They tend to find a place of balance somewhere in the middle. And obviously, they still have those ebbs and flows back and forth, but what they're doing is they're finding a place of balance, which means they're not creating the third soul. They're finding a balance, a language between the two souls. And that's not like some third being do it. It's the two souls talking to each other. And that's our lives. That's who we are. We are the merging of these two souls. And seemingly, if we do this during our lives, the point of completion is obviously the end of our lives. When we complete this, we, we've reached, a, hopefully, a place of peace, balance, and unity. We merge the godly with the natural. And to know, we're not overpowering the natural. We're merging the two. We're not supposed to lose touch with the world. We meet people that are spiritual, and they, they co- totally like, lock themselves off in the world. That's not the purpose. Into our daily affairs, into our day-to-day lives. We have to bring the godliness within the day-to-day life, and we need the day-to-day life to understand the godliness. They go hand in hand. And this makes up who we are. And also, the Tanya, the chapter 1, discusses the animal soul, or the human soul. And chapter 2 discusses the godly soul. The question is, why that order? Because in life, we're always introduced to the natural and the human first. We first get touch base with the physical world then we st- start searching for the spiritual. We're first very grounded in the physical in front of our eyes and then the spiritual. There's a great teacher, I don't remember his name, he um, once said that it's not fair. He says the spirituality is found in the books and the physicality before my eyes. He said if God would just reverse the two, I would be a perfect person. He put the physical as something I had to read right. in a book somewhere and the spiritual as something I lived with, I'm sure I'd live a spiritual life. Right. And that's the truth, though. The first comes this physical. We have to identify. We have to realize that. In other words, we, don't, we cannot lie to ourselves. Some people say, you know, this is spiritual and that's spiritual. It's not true. It's not this open, obvious thing. It's something we work on. It's something we strive on. Someone once asked me, he said, well, you're a rabbi. Obviously, every time you pray, you get this spiritual feeling. I'm like, what makes you think that there's some different chemistry inside of me that's not inside of you? That, like, when I become a rabbi, I get this feeling. Now I'm holy. It doesn't work. <laughs> We have the exact same chemical makeup. And therefore we have to recognize this. We have to realize who we are. We're not people that naturally are spiritually inclined. But within our makeup, it is there. And we have to draw it forth. And therefore, since it's fleeting, since it's deep and fleeting, since it's like a thought, it's very deep, but it's also fleeting, but it's also our essence that we can develop into an entire being. So today we're going to continue the idea of these ten spheres, these ten realms, or these ten parts that make up our soul. That's what we're going to go through today. We're not going to go through all ten. We're just going to go through the beginning ones. And we're going slowly. I know that in the beginning we were doing a third or half a chapter in a section. Right now this is a very backbone foundation. So we should get it well, get it right, and then move forwards. Today we're going to look at the first two intellectual uh, faculties, which is Chachma and Bina. And in that segment, there, that's what the book goes through, is this Chachma and Bina, what is it, 
What is it like? How do I relate to it? What is it to me? <clears throat> so first of all, Chachma. Chachma is the beginning of intellect. We spoke briefly about it last week. If you take the word Chachma, you can actually divide it into two words. And that's the Kayach Ma. The power of what? In general, in generalistic terms, we always say, what is Chachma? We say it's the beginning of understanding. Last week we said it's like the flash of knowledge that leads into understanding. We know there's three realms of intellect, and we generally call it, you know, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And we broke it up last week as wisdom being that flash, the starting point, understanding being the thought process, and knowledge the outcome. So we're going to look at it a little bit more deeply today and then try to apply it at least to the way we work. Maybe get more in tune with it. <clears throat> and the question is, how does our thought process work? How do we get a new idea into our heads? Sometimes we sit there and we don't get something, and we don't get something, and we don't get something, and finally we get it. What happens when we get it? What's going on? What's our process of getting something? If you can learn that, maybe we'll be able to get things more often. How do you train yourself to think of new things, to understand new concepts? How do you broaden that? We all know how to apply concepts we have. We work with that all the time, applying something we learn. But how do you get something new? How do you call yourself just to know something new? I'm not talking about reading a newspaper. That is a new information, but it's not really new knowledge. It's not a new idea. Because if it's found in the newspaper, it is a new idea. You have to struggle on it. You may have to reread it a few times until you train yourself to get it. But how does that training work? And that's sort of the opening idea question we're going to deal with. So I saw somebody that translates Chachma as conception. That's the w English word they want to use it. And they said, how does conception work? That was their, how do you, how do you get that process in your brain working? <clears throat> and in essence, when we, when we think about it, the true way to come to a beginning of a new understanding is by pushing one's self aside. In other words, one has to open themselves up to a new idea. They have to remove themselves to become open to a new understanding. They have to nullify themselves. They have to quiet themselves. They have to be completely open to a new idea. A lot of times we'll sit there, we'll hear something, and we'll struggle with it, and we'll struggle with it, and we'll struggle with it, and then we'll walk down the block. We'll forget about it. We'll get into our car. And a little, oh my gosh, I got it. Remember one day my mother turned to me and she says, I just figured out Staples is called Staples because they sell Staples. <laughs> and I remember sitting there and like, well, obviously. And then thinking about it made so much sense. She was trying to figure out what's this hidden message, right aid. Okay, we got that cute name going on. What's the cute name of Staples? And she's trying to grasp it and trying to grasp it. And then what was happening was she was bringing herself into the picture to understand it and was getting in the way of simply letting it in. And finally, when she forgot about it, it hit her. Oh, yeah, of course, they sell staples. There's a line, there's this cute line that people say is, how long is a Chinese name? If you've never heard it before, the immediate response is you start saying, well, what's the name? What type of name is it? it it's a longer name, it's going to have more letters, a shorter name is a shorter letters. And then you hear that it's not a question, but it's actually a statement. In other words, it's supposed to be like this cute joke that if someone, you know, if their name was how long, so you're making this open statement, how long is a Chinese name. So is it many other names, you know? John Smith is an American name, and how long is a Chinese name? So I've said this before, I was teaching a seventh grade English class once, and this was the example I gave for punctuation. And certain kids just couldn't get it. They were so focused on the line, they couldn't get it. But then what was happening was the next day they would come back in and be like, I got it. What happened? It's not that they finally wrapped their head around it so tightly, they finally squeezed the information inside their head. It's actually they finally push themselves away to allow the idea in. We have this with a lot of concepts. We prepare ourselves to understand. They say the best way of starting to learn is actually with a joke. Because through a joke, you alleviate yourself and then you open yourself up to ideas, concepts. So Chachma, if you take it, it's the Kayachma, it's the power of what. What is a question, it's emptiness. When you have the ability to say what, to say I don't know, to open yourself up, you have the ability to let in a new idea. What's the second one? Is Bina. Bina, in essence, is the exact opposite of Chachma. 
Because Bina is now that you get the idea, you're bringing yourself into the picture. You're applying yourself to this new idea. Bina is comprehension. Now that this new idea is formated within myself, how do I apply it to myself? How do I bring that into who I am? In other words, another example would be, there's a difference between, we say this a lot, there's a difference between seeing and understanding. When we see something, we have a very clear picture of it. But when we hear about it, we don't have that clear picture. We also have more detail. If someone were to show us a picture, you know, they just got this new mosaic mosaic in the gym. And someone's bar mitzvah, a very nice mosaic in the gym next door. If you were to go there and see it, you would see the mosaic. You saw it. You've gotten the picture clearly. If I were to sit here and describe to you the mosaic, I can go into the detail, I can go into how many it's made, how many pieces are in it, I can go into the colors, I can go into the nuances, all these wonderful things that you would not get through seeing it. But you would still not have the clarity of seeing. You would still not have that clear, I saw it. So one hand, there's advantage to seeing, because you see it, it's objective, it's clear in front of you, as opposed to when you hear about it, it's subjective. It's your opinion, no matter how you're going to take that information in, but you also have more information that you're getting. So on the one hand, when you get the flash, when you finally put yourself away and allow the flash of knowledge in, it's very clear to you. It's almost like you saw it. On the other hand, you don't know anything about it. You just see it. So it's a very objective, clear flash of an idea. When you first get it, it may only be a second, but you get it. Then, you start to process it. You start to comprehend it. And in essence, you're going away from the scene. You're going away from the clarity into a cloudedness, but a much more expanded cloudedness. A much more detailed, informed idea. There was a discourse I was, I was really studying for a long time. It was very complex to me. And I studied it for about four years on and off. I was trying to get different parts of it. And finally one day, I got it. And I, got, I understood it so, so clearly. The next day, I didn't understand the discourse as clearly as I did that first day. But I had a lot of outcomes from that discourse. I had a lot of ideas of how I could apply it to my life and to who I am. But I still didn't have that point as clear as I had it the day before. Sometimes when we wake up and we're groggy, we can see this process happening inside of us. We can split the two up. Because on the average day-to-day -day basis, we're running at such a high speed. We take in a new idea and we immediately start processing it. It's immediate comprehension. But it is going on in these two parts. I want to try to give an application to this before I move further. And the application to me, I'm going to apply this to the program from my essay, because when I was studying this, this is the first thing actually that came to mind, is that in essence, when one of us were to start the program, we're starting at a point of Chachma. We're starting at a point where we finally were willing to move ourselves away to let something new in. That's step one. That's what it is. It's the idea of finally, and you, you meet people, I met somebody last week, and they said, I get that I'm an addict, and I get this, and I get that, but I'm not ready to deal with that. And in essence, what they're saying is that they get the issues, but they're not willing to move themselves out of the way to allow in solution yet. And we see this all the time. We see people that fight against themselves for the own help that's right next door to them. Not only in the program, anywhere. You always, we always see that. If you would just stop for a second, you'd see it as clearly as we do. And the issue is, is that they're not pushing themselves away. They're not nullifying themselves to allow something <laughs> new in. That's the Chachma. The second you do, or the second I do, or the second any of us do, there's immediate dropping in, and there's immediate clarity. When someone finally hits their rock bottom, there's a clarity that exists only, hopefully, only once. They don't have that clarity as clear a week later, because they're a week away from that incident. But on that moment, they've got a very clear picture. Could you say that Chachma is like being teachable? Yeah. Okay. It's the process of becoming teachable. Becoming teachable. Now, after we have that clarity, the next step we got to do is take an action based upon that. Right? We can't just stay in step one. You got to take a step two. That's you stepping up to the plate with this new idea. That's you saying, I'm bringing this into myself. I'm taking this with me. Right? That's step two. That's Bina, comprehension, bringing it down into me. It's, okay, I get it. I've got an issue. I get it. I'm at rock bottom. I get it. There's a higher power. Now I need a sponsor to teach me. Now I need this. Now I need that. Now I need 
where all of a sudden the eye's back, all of a sudden the me's back, all of a sudden I'm making decisions, I'm choosing my sponsor. Shouldn't the program say, no, because now we have this idea that we're trying to apply. And what happens is, is the clarity that existed at point one, at moment one, which may last a day, may last for a little while, slowly will dissipate into a more clouded picture that's much more broad, much more expansive, and much more informed. So we move away from this clarity, this clear simpleness, but we move into a much more useful tool. It's the Bina. All of a sudden we have this vast knowledge, we have vast tools, we have vast things that we work on, we grow and we expand. And that's, the di- I'm using as an example for the difference between the way I understand Chachma and Bina. It's a flash of knowledge, a flash of this thing which comes through us letting ourselves out of the way to the Bina process. The Bina process is our comprehension, our applying it to ourselves, bringing it down into who we are. The subjectiveness. After we get to the objectiveness of there's an issue, there's a subjectiveness of me. Another example given between the Chachma and Bina is that Chachma is the father. We spoke about this briefly last week. It's this point. And Bina is the mother, the expanding of the point. We said that when you have a child, you actually have the father only gives a point. The mother sits for nine months and develops that point. And so too here, we have a flash, we have a beginning, but then there's a development of that. So then the question to be asked is where does Das come in? You just painted this. Great, we got it all, you know? You got the, you got the clarity and then you got the application and you bring it home to you and you got the whole system. We figured it out, you know? Now, now what's Das? Where are we going from there? What's the next step with Das? So there's many ways of looking at Das, and we're not going to cover all of them this week, but we're going to start. Das, first of all, there's the idea that in the Torah, in the Bible, it says, Adam yada es chava. Adam knew chava, right? That's it. Adam knew Eve. And uh, obviously, you know, like, um, people ask, what's wrong with knowing somebody? And they say the idea of knowing is also the idea of having a relationship and that which eventually leads to children, the idea of knowing, you know, knowing beyond just the basic knowledge of each other, but being in this marriage relationship that leads to kids. So Das is the connection between the father and the mother. It's the unity. It's that, it's what makes a fleeting moment into a lasting thing that goes beyond. In other words, if you take a flash of inspiration, and then you expand upon it, and then you leave it, it also leaves. It's, it may be real when you're there, but it fleets away. What cements it down, what makes it permanent, what makes it sustaining, is the das. The das is the connection. Das would be knowledge, but it's also attachment. Yeah? Can it also be practice, like practicing? So how do you get the attachment is through practice. In other words, das is is the attachment. How do we get that? We have to make that attachment. Bina would be the comprehension. How do we get that comprehension? We have to think it through and expand it, but Das would be, yeah, that's a good practice, would be a good way of attaching to it. The difference between a man and woman, so to speak, having relations, but nothing coming out of it, and then them giving birth to a child, would be the difference between Chachma and Bina, and Chachma and Bina and Dat, because Dat would be the birth of that. And if you think about it, the framework that we're talking about here is that the intellectual capacities give birth to emotions. So in Chachma, when you open yourself up to an idea, and that idea comes in, and then you go through the comprehension process, it's only real when you can then filter it through attachment that leads to the birth of your emotions, the rebirth of your emotions, the filtering of your emotions. That intellectual process needs to filter in to the rest of who we are. It needs to give birth to healthy emotions. We see emotional changes in people. I don't want to keep going back to the program. In this case, I don't also not want to. In this case, it works very well. Someone who does go through this process, what happens is they change the way they think and feel. When they have a change of feeling, we know the thinking is going somewhere right. Now, we may not know if they have a change in feeling because people can lie all the time. Hopefully, they won't be in a state of denial and lie to themselves. Hopefully, they will feel a change in feeling because they're changing their thinking. And this is not easy. These things don't happen. It's not like, oh, wow, I got the flash. So, obviously, the, the comprehension will take two minutes and then dot will take maybe five. No, this can take a long time. Re, 
we're giving birth to something that takes time. But this is the process of lastingness. This is the process of unity. If you think again, last week we spoke about the idea of Chachma being a point, Dot, uh, Bina being the expansion of this point, Dot is drawing it back to a point, back to somewhere we can go with, back to an ending of where we can say, oh, and this is what it is. If I were to sit here and show you a picture of the mosaic in the gym, and then you say, oh, I saw it, and then I take away that picture, and I say, now we're going to go through all the details of the picture, and I start getting into the technicals of how it was made, the glue, and the, con- and the, and I don't know, everything to do with it. It's very easy to get lost in that. Okay, so I know they used glue. I know there was 6,000 pieces. I know it took this amount of time to do that, and the drawing, what on earth were they making again? You'd be able to draw back and say, oh, and it was a mosaic. I remember that picture. Yeah, okay, so it was this mosaic. You have to have a finalysis to walk away from. And this is the ending of the intellectual process that will give birth, hopefully, to different emotions. In short, the emotions will go through, but they're going to be the love and the awe. In other words, how we handle this, whatever this thought is, will filter through that chain. We're going to pause and take some questions.